on this Friday night, fed up and fired up over George Floyd's death. The charges just filed and a new chorus of condemnation against police for this. Why am I under arrest? Sir? New Brunswick's growing COVID-19 outbreak traced to a doctor. The consequences for him and ramifications for his small community. A mother's gratitude. We've seen a glimpse of the son that we used to know. How the pandemic has been a saving grace for her son. And wild pool party of one. The unexpected guest making a splash. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Robin Gill. <laughs> After a night of violent unrest in Minneapolis, protests are spreading over the death of a black man in police custody. From Phoenix to Denver to Louisville and Los Angeles, people across the U.S. are outraged, demanding justice for George Floyd. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Four days after Floyd's death, there's been a major development in the case. The now former police officer, Derek Chauvin, who was captured on video, kneeling on George Floyd's neck as he gasped for air, has been charged with murder. Three other officers were part of the arrest. They were also fired, but haven't been charged. The governor of Minnesota is promising swift justice for all the officers involved. He's also appealing for calm, and at the same time, he's acknowledging the hurt caused by institutional racism and so many deadly interactions between black Americans and police. Minneapolis and St. Paul are on fire. The fires still smolder in our streets. The ashes are symbolic of uh, decades and generations of, of pain, of anguish, unheard, much like we failed to hear George Floyd as he pleaded for his life as the world watched. Floyd's death was the spark that ignited a firestorm in Minneapolis. And tonight, an uneasy tension remains across the city. Today, journalists covering the city's violent reaction were arrested on live television by state police. And as Jackson Prosco reports, we're learning more about what happened in the final minutes before Floyd's death. <laughs> A deep sense of unease hangs over Minneapolis after another night of chaos. Protesters clashed with police and set a local precinct ablaze. The mayor decided in this tense powder keg, better to let the building burn. The symbolism of a building uh, cannot outweigh the importance of life, of our officers or the public. We could not risk serious injury to anyone. The governor called in the National Guard to patrol the streets instead of the city's embattled police force, appealing for a return to order as a way to move forward. Help us use humane way to get the streets to a place where we can restore the justice so that those that are expressing rage and anger and demanding justice are heard. But the deep wounds are not quick to heal. The protests aren't just about the death of George Floyd, they're about a pain that spans generations. Get up. The arrest of former police officer Derek Chauvin. I can breathe. The man seen kneeling on the neck of the unarmed Floyd may quell some of the anger. We felt it appropriate to focus on the most dangerous perpetrator. I must say that this case has moved with extraordinary speed. Chauvin is charged with third degree murder and manslaughter. Charging documents allege he kept his knee on Floyd's neck for two minutes and 43 seconds after Floyd became unresponsive. The other three arresting officers, two of whom were seen kneeling on Floyd, are also expected to face charges. We want to see four arrests and charges for everything that they did that violated the law. Breathe! Breathe! But there is much more work to do to restore trust in authorities after the past week. You're on your arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, telling me whoa. why I'm under arrest, sir? A CNN reporter was arrested on live television by Minnesota State Police while his white colleagues were untouched. While on the burnt out streets of Minneapolis, dozens of businesses are left to pick up the pieces after being looted and vandalized. It's not fair. It's not right. You know, we've been working so hard for this place. No, this is not just for me, it's for my family. Jackson, the former police officer is charged with third-degree murder, something Canada does not have. What is the penalty involved in this? 
In fact, most states don't have this charge, Robin. It's a depraved indifference murder. In other words, the allegation is that the person caused bodily harm but did not set out to kill someone. Uh, the district attorney pointed out it's quite possible that more charges could be added. So this may not be the final charge that that officer faces at this point. And Jackson, late today, President Trump spoke about the situation in Minneapolis. What did he have to say? Yeah, this is certainly a moment of national angst and anger in this country, and the president has been fanning the flames largely from the sidelines. Late this afternoon, he did appear in front of the cameras to say he had spoken with George Floyd's family and offered his condolences, but it's a series of, over, of overnight tweets that have really raised concerns. In those tweets, the president called the protesters, quote, thugs. He went on to say that, quote, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And that phrase is widely acknowledged as a racist trope that dates back to the 1960s. Uh, the tweet was actually flagged by Twitter for uh, what they say was glorifying violence. Trump later says he spoke the words as a fact, not a statement. Joe Biden also addressed the nation today, saying he too spoke with Floyd's family, uh, saying that uh, the nation, the very soul of the nation, is at stake. And former President Barack Obama also weighed in with a statement of his own, saying that what happened to Floyd should not be normal in the America of 2020. Robin? Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thanks, Jackson. NBC's Morgan Chesky is in Minneapolis tonight. He joins us now. Morgan, how are the people there reacting to the news of the former police officer being charged? Well, Robin, good evening. They're certainly acknowledging Chauvin's arrest as a positive step towards justice, but there are quite a few people here in this very crowd we're standing in right now, just a few blocks away from that third precinct, uh, that believe that even third-degree murder is not enough, uh, considering what these men did to George Floyd. Uh, one arrest has happened. We do know that three more potential arrests could take place with those other officers that were involved in his death. Uh, but it really is a uh, mixed emotions right now in this crowd uh, that the past two days were calling for justice, calling for something to be done. And upon hearing of Chauvin's arrest today, uh, have acknowledged it. But now they want to see what comes next. Robin? Ha has it diffused the anger at all? During the day, we have seen relatively calm crowds here, Robin. And so as far as the anger, that will really be a time will tell. We know that the majority of the destruction that's happened here in southern Minneapolis has come after nightfall. That's when these peaceful crowds that you see behind me uh, are joined or replaced altogether by a much more destructive group of people uh, intent on inflicting as much damage as they can in this area. Now, if tempers die down, uh, we should see a hopeful change tonight. And one thing that could help with that is a citywide curfew that has been put into place by the mayor of Minneapolis, Minneapolis starting at 8 p.m. Friday night, and that will last throughout the weekend. Uh, and with that in place, with the addition of these state patrol officers and the arrival of the National Guard today, uh, those elements combined should hopefully stop what we've witnessed the past two nights, uh, which essentially have been uh, a free-for-all in certain areas of the city uh, where people have been able to break into businesses, take what they want, uh, continue to loot, start fires, uh, and cause significant damage to this part of the city. Robin? A lot of eyes are on the police. How are they managing the situation now? Uh, Robin, I think they're managing it as carefully as they can because they just know how much... Um, how many impassioned people there are in this crowd and how quickly tempers can rise considering what we've seen over the past several days. Uh, we know that as it stands right now, they have full riot gear on. They're maintaining a very, very tight perimeter around that damaged area. Uh, and that looks to be the plan going forward. Uh, we anticipated what they're doing today. Uh, last night when we were reporting just a block or two away from that third precinct. Um, but whenever protesters started to approach that building uh, and gained access to it, uh, the police presence that was inside there vacated the area. Uh, and that is really when we watch this crowd move from one building to another. And so it's been a, a very uh, contrasting style and strategies uh, from yesterday until today and we can only hope that that means that the damage that we've seen finally comes to a stop here in Minneapolis. This is a community uh, that has been very much left in shock as a result to, uh, of the death of George Floyd and so those who live nearby have come out witnessed the devastation for themselves uh, and it's tough even for them uh, to believe when they see it firsthand and you combine that with the people that have driven in here uh, to send a message and it leaves a very surreal experience uh, for this city that uh, is now trying to grieve the loss of George Floyd uh, but also begin to pick up the pieces from just so much damage. Robin? Morgan Jeske in Minneapolis tonight. Thanks Morgan.
to the COVID-19 pandemic now. The New Brunswick doctor linked to a cluster of new cases has now been suspended. He traveled outside the province and failed to self-isolate before returning to work. New Brunswick, until now, appeared to have the virus under control. But as Ross Lord reports, restrictions are now being reimposed as people scramble to get tested. In New Brunswick, they're learning it only takes one person's poor judgment to stain a spotless record. After announcing this month all 120 people with COVID-19 had recovered, there's a growing outbreak in the small community of Campbellton. We have two new active cases today, bringing the number of active cases to eight. One of the cases is an employee at a long-term special care facility. There were about 50 residents uh, in that facility, and again, they've all. we have a rapid deployment team that was sent there to test them all. The person blamed for spreading the virus is a doctor who traveled to Quebec and decided not to self-isolate after returning to New Brunswick. In fact, the doctor saw patients at this hospital and possibly other locations for two weeks. He's been suspended indefinitely and the RCMP is investigating possible criminal wrongdoing. A cluster has caused the province to reverse some loosening measures in the Campbellton area, forcing a return to a two-family bubble. Some Campbellton businesses that were closed, then reopened, are imposing restrictions again. We at least lost 30% of our clientele reopening the first time. But now, reopening again, I think people might be scared to actually come to public places. So we could lose a lot more clients again also. The decision of one person, uh, so I'm not blaming all the health care. I'm blaming the person that took the decision to... Uh, to do uh, this to the region. We have hundreds of people that came in our restaurants in the past two weeks. So uh, we're, we're going to do like everybody else and go get tested and uh, hopefully uh, we're all good. For a province that took pride in suppressing the virus, it's a troubling reminder of how easily it can reappear to slow reopening and increase anxiety. Ross Lord, Global News. Ontario, which is struggling to meet its daily testing goals, is expanding its COVID-19 testing strategy. The targeted campaign will focus on first responders, workers at select hospitals, staff and inmates in some correctional facilities, those who work at liquor stores, and people who live in vulnerable communities like long-term care homes. Pop-up assessment centres and mobile testing units will be used in the province's hardest hit areas. Ontario's Premier says the expanded testing strategy is the best defence against the virus as the province reopens. He's also considering regional reopening. Premier Ford joined all the premiers from across the country in a virtual meeting with the Prime Minister last night, their 11th weekly meeting since the pandemic began. One of the key issues discussed, long-term care homes. Our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, joins us now for more on the meeting and what was decided. David? Well, Robin, the Prime Minister and the Premiers met for about 90 minutes last night, and when it was over, the PMO issued a statement saying that they agreed to take action to improve care for seniors. But today, the Prime Minister was vague when we asked him what specific action he will take. We have said at the federal level that we will be there to support the provinces, both in the immediate, whether it's more rent money or more resources or whatever it is that the provinces need to get control once again over their long-term care facilities. And there was no word on whether the federal government will set national standards for long-term care facilities. That's something a lot of experts are calling for. We will be there for those conversations uh, in the medium and long term, but right now we're we're still dealing with this emergency uh, of getting people the support they need. Now, earlier this week, five Liberal MPs, all from the Greater Toronto area, sent an open letter to the Prime Minister asking that Ottawa get to work building, quote, enforceable national standards. Now, those five Liberal MPs had a meeting this morning with Health Minister Patty Haidu. I'm told it was a productive meeting, but the Trudeau Liberals do not want to pick a fight with the provinces over this, and I'm told Quebec does not want a national anything. So if they do wish to proceed, it's going to be in cooperation with the provinces. Robin? David Aiken in Ottawa. Canada's cruise control extended. Coming up when these ships could be allowed back in Canadian waters.
Quebec's education department says a total of 41 students and teachers have tested positive for COVID-19 since elementary schools reopened on May 11th. A survey of school boards found that 19 students and 22 staff members have become infected. The province has allowed elementary schools outside the Montreal area to reopen, but cancelled the rest of the school year in the city itself. The province now has more than 50,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19. The federal government is providing First Nations communities with more funding to help them cope with the pandemic. Ottawa plans to spend another $650 million to help pay for supplies, medical care and facilities to allow for social distancing. The On Reserve Income Assistance Program will increase by $270 million to ensure families don't have to choose between food and rent right now. And more than $44 million will be spent over five years to build 12 shelters in Indigenous communities for women and children fleeing violence. Changes could be coming to restrictions at the U.S.-Canada border. The Prime Minister says he's looking at ways to help reunite families stranded on either side of the border by the COVID-19 restrictions. This would not change the approach on uh, closing the borders until the end of June, and uh, depending on discussions beyond. But it is looking at uh, can we support families that are going through extremely difficult times. We will continue to engage with them. We will continue uh, to look into this matter and ensure that no matter what we do, we are keeping the safety of Canadian and well-being of Canadians at the forefront of any decision. The federal government extended its ban on cruise ships until the end of October. In March, the government banned cruise ships carrying more than 500 people until July. But today, Transport Minister Mark Garneau said cruise ships with more than 100 people are no longer allowed to visit Canadian waters or dock at ports in Canada until at least October 31st. If they break the rules, the companies face fines of $25,000. Still ahead, how COVID-19 is changing, how some battle drug addiction. Fentanyl and other opioids can slow a person's breathing. So COVID-19, which attacks the respiratory system, can increase the risk of dying for those who use these drugs. In some parts of the country, harm reduction programs have been helping. Our Heather Yerkes West shows us how one family has benefited from what they call a blessing. Keegan Tierney has battled drug addiction for close to 10 years. It's been a struggle, especially the last couple of years. Um, been homeless, uh, you know, just jail, everything's just, you know, it's been like hell. But the last few weeks We've have been different, and Tierney says he has the coronavirus happened. pandemic to thank. We've seen a glimpse of the sun that we used to know. And it's been a long time since we've seen that. When Tierney came out of a detox program in April, a local charity offered him a chance to self-isolate in a hotel. And each day, a mobile therapy program comes to him. So uh, basically, instead of doing fentanyl, they give you a dose of hydromorphine, as well as methadone or uh, suboxone, and uh, kind of slowly decrease that dose until you're ready to... Uh, be completely sober. This is a place where we really, really could use massive scale up and that would be very, very helpful in addressing both the COVID pandemic and the overdose crisis. Harm reduction advocates believe initiatives that provide a so-called safe supply to those experiencing addiction are vital both now and after physical distancing measures end. In March, BC became the first province in the country to introduce clinical guidance around the prescription of pharmaceutical grade controlled substances as a form of harm reduction. Really, this is our opportunity to see how um, acceptable, how many people will be willing to prescribe. Um, so it's a guidance document that has been introduced because of COVID. Um, but obviously we would hope that safer supply and pharmaceutical alternatives continue after COVID-19. Tierney's been told he has a safe place to stay here until at least the end of August. Enough time, he says, to make a plan for what's next. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. Up next, higher risks, the question that's sparking great debate about COVID-19. As restrictions ease across the country, the number of COVID-19 cases could rise. And many Canadians are wondering if the changes will put them at risk. Our Jeff Semple has taken your questions 
straight to the experts. Your chances of catching COVID-19 depend a lot on where you live. Dave from Ottawa asks, are people in apartment buildings at a higher risk? Yes, uh, only in that you are more likely to encounter different kinds of people in the elevator. But not all apartments are created equal. The City of Toronto just released this interactive map that reveals COVID cases by neighborhood. Downtown, there are relatively few compared with neighborhoods to the north. You're seeing that it's disproportionately affecting in, uh, people of lower income. This North Toronto neighborhood, Glenfield Jane Heights, is home to the city's highest number of COVID-19 cases. And like many other hotspots, it's also home to a lot of multi-unit, low-income housing. If they're living at home with seven family members in a two-bedroom apartment with one bathroom, the ability for that person to to safely quarantine themselves is next to impossible. Jackie from Abbotsford asks, why do more women appear to be affected by COVID-19 than men? In most countries, men have been the hardest hit. In Italy, 71% of victims were male. It probably has to do with the fact that men have bad behaviors in general. Men are more likely to smoke, to take less good care of themselves. But in Canada, women are bearing the brunt. A recent report found 53% of Canada's COVID-19 deaths were women, the highest proportion of any country. Experts point to the site of Canada's worst outbreaks. Women are much more likely to work and live in long-term care homes. Women are, are certainly overrepresented in, in these long-term care facilities simply because women live longer than men. Dwight asks if smokers, including cannabis smokers, are more vulnerable to the virus, a question that's sparking some debate. A few recent studies have actually suggested nicotine or cannabis might offer some protection against COVID-19. But many experts believe they're blowing smoke. Any type of uh, smoking-related uh, activity can most likely put you at higher risk. So, uh, but again, you know, uh, I could be wrong and I wouldn't come to that conclusion until we know all of the data. Data from thorough, peer-reviewed studies, which for a new virus is still largely lacking, leaving many questions about who's most at risk unanswered, at least for now. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Robin Gill. With heat waves rolling through Canada, we leave you tonight with the wild way a Canadian symbol managed to cool off. This moose was caught taking a dip in an Ottawa man's pool. The trespasser treaded water for hours before jumping out and then over the fence. Thank you for watching. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.